first of all, I want to thank Highland Park Library and Lori, thank you, for sponsoring today's presentation. This program, uh, Majestic Monarchs and Butterfly Gardens, is part of a series of programs, all on loving life at home is the theme. I am a real estate agent here in Highland Park with At Properties. And um, I do this as a volunteer and a contribution to our community. Uh, these workshops have primarily a gardening theme, but also a home sales theme for that series uh, for helping people find homes that they love or prepare their homes to make them homey looking. Anyway, we won't be talking about that or real estate, just about loving life at home today. And my gardening experience, um, well, actually, I'm going to say the gardening series is especially relevant today. And you can see on the bottom beneath the strawberries, um, this is an opportunity to continue staying safe at home and enjoying it. And while we will be opening up again very soon in phases, um, it will still be nice to be able to do things at home and to continue somewhat isolating so uh, we don't continue to spread this terrible virus. All right, promises for today. Let's see if we can get to that one way or another. Okay, so this is one of my favorite quotes and I think it's particularly appropriate today, which is that to grow a garden is to believe in tomorrow. And I think that is um, especially relevant today. And that's Audrey Hepburn who said that. Uh, today, I'm gonna go through a little bit of housekeeping and background. Um, so what's the big deal about monarchs? They're just one of our, one of many beautiful butterflies, but they are a very unique species that I'll be talking about. Um, why to have a butterfly garden. And as you will see all these other points on butterfly gardens, monarchs, and an opportunity for you guys to start right away. All right, so who am I? Um, I'm Marissa Hopkins, and um, I think I've already mentioned to please, this is the housekeeping part, sorry, we'll get to that other piece in a moment. Um, for this Zoom workshop, if you wouldn't mind trying to put your name on your screen, you can change it. I don't have the exact instructions for doing that. I know I've done it before. I've also said, write your questions in chat and we'll come back to them at Q&A at the end. Um, I'm also encouraging you to email me. And when you do so, I'll be getting your email address and I will then send you a presentation summary, basically the slides from today. Uh, you'll also get entered in a raffle for some little milkweed plants that I just started growing this year. I'm gonna talk about growing milkweed as one of the things we can do. This happens to be common milkweed. Uh, there are many different kinds. And also, everybody can get free, free seeds today that you can start right away in your garden, both of which dill and zinnia are heavenly to butterflies and other pollinators. So you will be able to get those for free, and I groom in my yard. Um, so I will then email you when and where to pick them up. And... Um, I said pick up on Saturday on this slide. I'm not sure that that's exactly what I'm going to do. I, I'll come back to this at the end because it is a holiday weekend and I don't know if people are traveling. Um, but I want to say something about email addresses. First of all, I never use them for uh, business purposes. I never share email addresses and I never give them to anyone else. The only way I use them is to let people know about more loving life at home uh, workshops to communicate with you about gardening and to um, invite you to our fall social, which I will be talking about at the end. And then finally, I'd love for you to email me uh, with your feedback. And as you can see from our spring garden, we had someone who specifically commented how much uh, he enjoyed, has been enjoying gardening indoors and out and has been a welcome ray of optimism during the quarantine. Um, and another woman recently said to me, and I love this, that it, that the hot crops workshop brought a smile to her face uh, that lasted all day long. I thought that was pretty awesome. I hope that today's workshop will do the same for you. All right, so who am I? Um, 
And why am I doing this is probably more of the important question. Uh, butterfly gardening is relatively new to me. It actually started out of uh, fascination with monarchs. Um, my husband, I'm referring to as the country boy, kids and caterpillars because my husband was raised on what's now a state park in Northern Illinois. And he used to bring in caterpillars when my kids were young and really throughout our marriage, put them in jars, they'd grow into chrysalises and we'd watch the butterflies emerge. Um, kids loved it, I loved it. It was really fun. Um, I don't encourage anyone to do it without knowing what they're doing. So that's something you can talk about to talk to me about at another time. But that's what stimulated my interest. And then I learned more about monarchs and milkweed. I had tons of milkweed. I offered free seeds last two years ago to people um, through next door. And I had over 50 people respond saying they wanted milkweed seeds. So we had our first social uh, where we did a big seed exchange and gave away milkweed seeds. And that's what precipitated my commitment to do a workshop last year. This is me publicizing it at uh, the terrific tomato competition in Highwood, which I was a sponsor. Um, to commit to doing this workshop. So I am not exactly an expert on butterflies, but I have certainly learned a lot over the years in dabbling as I have with my vegetable garden. Um, I'm going to give a special uh, kudos to Cheryl Rice. And for those of you who are on next door, probably know about Cheryl. She's brilliant when it comes to butterflies and gardens but she is shy when it comes to public speaking because trust me, I'd have her up here before me, but she wouldn't do it. Anyway, I do it for peaceful enjoyment. What you see down here is my uh, kitchen garden, which is a, a garden that has very long history, not with me, but in general, uh, for being the small garden that farmers would often have close to their home uh, from which they, ate the summer and then preserved for the winter. And here you can see is a big patch of zinnia. This is very early in the season and these are the zinnia seeds that will be available to you. Okay, wrong. All right, so what's the problem and why monarchs? Did we have, yes, we did. Okay, good. Um, the biggest problem with monarchs is that they're significantly on the decline. Um, about 80% of their population is estimated to have gone down over the last 15 years. And um, as you'll soon see, they all migrate to one of two places and that's where they do the counts. How they count, I have no idea, but it is down significantly. Um, as you can see, the US Fish and Wildlife Service also does a survey and they estimate that monarch butterflies have vanished to about the tune of 80 mil, uh, about a billion. Um, the importance of monarchs is that um, they travel always on the same pathway. And in the middle of our, in the corn belt, is where they do a lot of mating. They also pollinate. But the biggest problem is the only thing that plant that monarch caterpillars will eat is milkweed. And with all the pesticides and herbicides and um, expansion of corporate farms, those plants have become depleted and they need to be able to eat along the way as they migrate north. They are a migrating butterfly and we'll be talking about that as, it, as we progress. I just wanted to set that groundwork. We'll be coming back to monarchs uh, towards the end. All right, so let's get into butterfly gardens. <clears throat> butterfly gardens are a flower garden butterflies and pollinators love to visit. A pollinator is basically any insect <clears throat> or bird, hummingbirds are pollinators, that literally uh, sip the nectar of the plant and in doing so carry pollen from plant to plant, which is what enables us to have fruits and vegetables we would be in big trouble without pollinators. So we want to support them. And uh, butterfly gardens support both butterflies and all pollinators. Uh, hopefully you'll have hummingbirds. We actually saw a ruby throat in our yard this morning. And uh, 
so the, the butterfly garden both supports the adults, but also hopefully will also support their larva. And I'll be talking more about that. All right, five essential elements for a butterfly garden. Sun, nectar and host plants, shelter, water, and winter protection. All right, first sun. Butterfly gardens generally need a lot of sun. Um, that's because we primarily grow flowers in them and flowers uh, need sun as a general rule, not all, but, but the ones the butterflies seem to love. And, um, and so the flowers that need sunlight attract more butterflies. So you wanna choose a very sunny place uh, for your garden. I mentioned two types of flowers, nectar flowers and host plants. Now, as I mentioned to you, the monarch has um, its, its, its larva only eat milkweed. M many of the butterflies have very specific plants um, that their caterpillars will eat. And so therefore you want to know what the host plants are and then there are the nectar plants. All the pollinators need nectar, it's the food, it's the strength that they need um, in the case of the monarchs to migrate back. And uh, for all the butterflies, they need it. And so to attract butterflies, you wanna have a large swath of color. You don't really wanna plant like an individual row of flowers, you wanna have a big patch. And here you can see in this picture down here, this is a, a Eastern black swallowtail in my zinnia garden. And you can see how dense it is. Uh, you also can bring, cut those flowers and bring them in the house, which is pretty cool. Um, so you wanna plant in mass and you wanna have it be a lot of bright, beautiful colors. Um, the other thing is because we have butterflies from as early as now, earlier, probably end of April, beginning of May, and then all the way through till October, maybe even early November, depending on how warm it is. And so therefore you wanna make sure that you have flowers that'll be continuously blooming. Right now, actually, the butterflies are sipping on dandelions and whatever else is out there. Um, so let's see. The other thing I mentioned here is about deadheading. What that means is once the flower dies on a flower plant, it's taking off the dead head. And this is particularly true, especially even with zinnia or flowers that bloom all summer, because the more you take the dead heads off the plants, uh, the bigger the plants will grow and the more flowers they'll produce. It'll actually encourage them to produce more flowers. So the other category of plants are host plants. Um, butterflies only lay eggs on the plant that their caterpillars will eventually eat. Some are more particular than others. Uh, for example, the monarch only eats milkweed, whereas the eastern black swallowtail, which we have a lot of around here, um, is a little less picky. It'll use parsley, dill, fennel, carrot, rue, uh, maybe one other plant. But these, I don't know if you've ever, you know, broken any of those, but they have a very similar and distinct smell. And so the eastern swallowtail will lay her eggs on those plants. Of course, she's, they still need the nectar, but, um, that's a really great plant to have in your garden, hence the dill seeds and the zinnia seeds. Um, painted ladies, I just thought they were really funny. We usually see those before the monarchs. Um, they're much smaller, they're about two inches in their full wing spread. They're also a migrating butterfly, but they are in no way endangered. They are actually on all continents except Antarctica and Australia, so they're all over the globe. They're very unique in that uh, regard. And they are not picky eaters. Um, sometimes, sometimes they're known as thistle butterflies because it appears their preferred plant is the thistle, but they'll eat anything and lay eggs anywhere. So they are by no means endangered. I just thought they were pretty funny. But they are a migrating butterfly like the monarch, so I thought I'd raise that. Uh, the red ad admiral only eats nettles or false nettles. 
we have, these are butterflies we have around here and the morning cloak actually is a tree, tree butterfly. It relies on willows, American elm, cottonwood, aspen and birch, which some of you may actually already have in your backyard. All right, here's just a list of butterfly attracting flowers. It's only a partial list. The one nice thing about the chives, and again, this is in my backyard, um, is that they come back every year and they're, they, they bloom early, but their blooms don't last long. That's the only negative. The plants here with uh, asterisks, those are all annuals. Uh, the majority of these plants are perennials, which means once you plant them once, they keep coming back, assuming they're taken care of. Um, okay, so here we have, since we have a lot of deer around here, and some of you probably have to deal with that more than others, it's not an issue in my yard, but most of us, at least in Highland Park, certainly have this as an issue. Here's a list of some plants that are native to Illinois um, that you might want to consider planting. Butterfly weed, as you can see here, is one of the plants I'll be giving away. Again, you'll get these slides if you email me, so you will have these lists. Shelter. Now this is really critical. Most butterflies and insects don't migrate the way the painted lady and the monarchs do. So um, I jumped the gun. Right now while they're here and they're alive and flying around, they need shelter. <laughs> they also need this later when they're hibernating. But they need shelter to protect them from wind and rain. Um, so when they do need shelter, they cling to either the underside of leaves or they climb deep into tall grasses or literally tuck themselves into the crevices of rocks. So if you have like a wood pile or a leaf pile um, in your or near your butterfly garden, that might help them uh, in a storm like we've had for the past three days. Uh, they also need shelter at night when they rest and again, Trees are one way for them to be protected, tall grasses, rock piles, and then um, we'll skip the hibernation because I have a whole slide on that. All right, the other thing butterflies need is water, but butterflies can't swim, nor can they land in water. So the only way you can really help them in this regard is to put out what's called a puddler. Oh, I meant to have something. Oh, well, I was gonna show you one. Um, and basically, it's a large shallow dish. In this case, it's just a terracotta, you know, dish probably that you'd put under a standard terracotta pot. And roughly 12 to 18 inches in diameter. And you put sand or coarse dirt in there, uh, along with some rocks, because you're going to put some water in there, not so that they can swim, but so that there is moisture. and um, and then the rocks are there for them to land on so they can then um, sip the water. You do want to put that in a sunny protected area near your butterfly friendly flowers. So somewhere in that grouping of zinnia would be a great place. Wrong button. All right, here's winter protection. Again, there are two things butterflies will do, or all insects, either they're gonna hibernate or they're going to migrate, and most hibernate. So butterflies, bees, and other pollinators do need cover to pr protect them from the harsh elements, either storms in late, you know, late fall and snow in winter, um, and they survive by using natural shelters. Um, the migrators, like the monarchs, painted ladies, and hummingbirds, are more reliant on your food in the fall, um, and that's how you help them. So for the non-migrating, or the hibernating, um, these are ways you can help support them in the fall. And that would be by leaving hollow canes, say from a raspberry plant or dead flower stalks from perennials, just leave them in place. Don't include them in your spring cleaning, but do include them in your, uh, I'm sorry, reverse that. 
do include them in your spring cleaning, but leave them up for your fall so that the, the creatures will have them throughout the fall and winter. Same with leaves on the ground. Um, they are an insulated hideaway for many of our pollinators. And um, it's actually better to leave your leaves in your garden because that's what replenishes the nutrients in your soil. So what we do is we simply put them in our flower beds. You can either have your landscapers chop them up, which they'll do with their uh, lawnmowers, and then rake them in so they don't fly around as much, or you can just throw them in with your, in your vegetable and flower and gardens in your house. Um, so these are other things that uh, butterflies and bees and pollinators could use. And that again is old wooden bark, so dead trees, etc. cetera. Um, and undisturbed soil is where bumblebees live. And they actually live there all year long. Um, this is a swallowtail chrysalis. And what's interesting about the swallowtail, here you can see it's connected, it's also connected here. The monarch uh, chrysalis is only connected in one point, and you'll see a picture of that shortly. But what's interesting about the swallowtail is these chrysalises can be green or brown, depending on where they hang themselves. And um, swallowtails can emerge during uh, the summer season, and I've had that happen, but I also have about five right now that are in my garage. We're waiting for those to open and they wintered over. So we'll see what happens. So that's actually one of my chrysalises that I have right now. All right, keeping your garden natural. This is another way to support butterflies. Um, you want wildflowers to grow in and around your yard. Uh, you might want to organize them, but in general, that's what the butterflies need. Again, keep the raked leaves, uh, postpone pulling up dead annual, annual, <laughs> annuals and perennials. This is all um, what I already said. Now, one thing I do wanna say though, is if you feel this is too messy, clean up just the front edge of your most visible area of your gardens and leave the back section until spring. All right. Let's talk a little about the monarch butterfly. Did you guys know it's the Illinois State butterfly? Yes, show of heads. We have a butterfly, yay! <laughs> Pretty fun. Um, and yes, it's the monarch. I guess it makes sense since we are probably one, it's one of its primary breeding grounds. Now, as I mentioned, the monarchs migrate, which makes them very unique. Um, and as you know, they're absolutely spectacular uh, creatures. They mate in March and in their breeding grounds, which is actually one of two places. Um, if they are east of the Rockies, which we are, uh, they all fly south to Mexico to just a handful of places, all near relatively close to Mexico City. And they all go to the exact same trees. All right. Now there is a whole cycle to this. So just keep that in the back of your mind. If they're west of the Rockies, they actually um, fly south to California and northern Mexico uh, on the Baja uh, Peninsula. So again, they go to the same place and they actually will live in eucalyptus trees there. I'm not going to try and pronounce the fur that the monarchs go to in Mexico, but you can see it there. Um, so what happens is they mate in their Mexican retreat or their California retreat, and then they start flying north. And their first stop is going to be somewhere in the Southern states. And um, I'll, talk, I'll come back to that in one moment. Uh, one of the reasons they migrate is they will not survive below 50, 55 degrees. So they need to go south. They need the flowers um, to give them the energy. And they will leave, starting in Canada, depending how far north they go, um, they will leave in October, roughly, and then arrive in Mexico for our monarchs, their final destination in roughly November. So there are hundreds of millions of these. 
that travel 80 miles a day, up to 3,000 miles total, to then go to their hibernation place in Mexico. But they are active down there. They're still eating. They're just not as active as they would be normally. All right, so milkweed. This is a common milkweed. This is the monarch's absolute favorite, favorite milkweed. It is indigenous to our area. And it's the milkweed in general is the only plant that monarchs will lay their eggs. Um, as soon as the caterpillars hatch, and you'll see what a tiny, tiny one looks like, they'll begin eating the milkweed. And that's all they're going to eat until they then form their own chrysalis. So providing milkweed in your butterfly garden is again one of the host plants and it increases the number of monarchs that you'll actually have. Um, okay, there are other local native milkweeds. One is swamp, another one is butterfly. There is also showy milkweed and those are all native milkweeds. There are some not so native milkweeds, the blood flower, for example, but that's really a tropical plant. And butterfly lovers in general encourage you to grow milkweed that is indigenous to where you live. So that would not be a milkweed you'd wanna grow because somehow, some way they think it confuses the monarchs. So since we don't really know how the monarchs even know to go back and forth to Mexico, I don't want to mess with that. So your call. But the other thing to know about milkweed is when you break it, um, you will. there is a white milky substance inside that you don't want to get in your eyes. Um, some people say, I mean, actually, there are some toxins in milkweed, nothing that's going to kill you. But... Um, that is one of the things they say deter butterflies from eating the caterpillars, but the caterpillars do get eaten and their eggs get eaten. Um, and you'd be surprised how many eggs a monarch lays a season. So here you go, the magnificent monarch's life cycle. There are four stages and they go through five generations. Uh, before they fly south. It's the fourth or fifth generation that actually is the migrator. So, first of all, remember they made it in March in Mexico. That could be a song. Anyway, yes, they made it in March in Mexico and they flew north. They usually make it as far north as Texas before those monarchs who are now about eight months old. Think about that, they lived that long. Um, lay their eggs, and then those butterflies become the first generation that are going to fly north to us. This particular, um, so what happens then when they fly to us is those monarchs, again, breed in the Midwest in the Corn Belt, and by the time they get here, about two weeks later, they lay eggs, this is an egg, in our milkweed plants, and uh, they lay between 300 and 400 eggs total. And they take roughly four to five days to hatch, but out of 100 eggs, maybe one or two will actually hatch. And that's what you see here. This is a little caterpillar or larva that literally just hatched from the egg. And they look pretty funny, don't they? I think they're really cute. And I'm going to tell you, if it's this big, I'm exaggerating. You need a magnifying glass to see it. This is highly, highly, highly magnified. All right, two to the caterpillar. This is what the monarch caterpillar looks like. It's this yellow, black, and white type zebra stripe. Very pretty. Um, the caterpillar actually goes through five stages, and it sheds each time. So when you saw that teeny one, it eats and eats and eats and eats and it gets big and then all of a sudden it stops eating and it sheds and then it, get, it you look again and it's bigger and then it does that five times, which they call instars, five star, five times. And that takes about two weeks to become a fully developed caterpillar, which this is closer uh, to that. All right, so now you have the caterpillar and it's ready to become a butterfly. It's been 
eating tons of milkweed, and I mean tons, you need to have a ready supply of milkweed every day in order to feed these caterpillars. And by the time they're ready to form a cocoon, they go into what's called a J. And it takes them about 18 hours. You'll start knowing when that's gonna happen. And um, so you might outside in nature see the caterpillar, this is only the monarch now, remember that, go into this J. And about 18 hours later, all of a sudden, you're going to come back and see that it's this beautiful turquoise cocoon. Now, this one's pretty far along um, because you can start seeing the wings uh, showing up through the cocoon. But roughly um, in eight to 10 days from when it's a J, it'll get to this stage, which is right before it emerges and that word is called enclosed as a monarch butterfly. And there you go. So here you can see that the cocoon becomes completely translucent when it emerges and then its wings slowly open um, and they're wet, they actually need to dry. So again, there are one to four generations um, that need to find food need to mate, need to lay eggs, and that lasts about two to six weeks and then they die. So generation four or five are the actual migrators and they live 10 times longer than all the other, their predecessors. Um, and they live eight to nine months because remember they start here and they fly south to Mexico where they live until they mate in March and then come back north. So they are our migrating monarchs, which are just amazing. So how can you help monarchs specifically thrive? So of course, establishing a butterfly garden. This is actually big for all butterflies, which is not to spray herbal herbicides or pesticides on your garden. And I know that's a hard thing to do because we love green lawns. Uh, but if you love butterflies and pollinators, it's better not to do that. Um, another is to plant wildflowers in areas that maybe you really haven't cultivated, but would be in the sun or conducive to growing wildflowers. Um, in your towns, you can encourage your community to do that in parks and parkways. Um, really, wherever there's open space, we don't necessarily need to always have just mowed grasses, but we could support wildflower gardens and milkweed. Um, the other thing you can do is follow and report sightings of monarchs on Journey North, uh, which is actually a kid site, but it's got a lot of great resources. And you can find out where the nearest monarch sighting has been recently. And then finally, I'd encourage you to get kids, grandkids, your own kids, nieces, nephews involved, because that's really how recycling took off, uh, was through our generation as children. And children, you know, once they develop an interest or an understanding, they carry that with them through the rest of their lives. So. It's also fun and interesting to watch the butterflies and it's beautiful to see them every day. Now, if you wanna grow your own milkweed, I actually learned a trick and I wanna share it with you. I won't go into this in great detail, but growing milkweed is very, very hard because the seeds don't like to germinate, but they will. First of all, if you're going to gather seeds in the fall, you have to make sure that they are, um, I forgot the word, but they need to be kept very, very, very cold, like in your refrigerator for six weeks or more. I keep them in my garage. But second of all, um, when spring comes, the easiest way and most uh, reliable way to start your own milkweed is to, well, I bought commercial packets. You can see them here. Here's the showy, and here is actually a swamp milkweed. And what, I, what you actually do is, here's step one, is you take like little baggies and wet paper towels and you make like a little sandwich. You can see right here of seeds. And you literally fold that over, I marked my seeds, 
and stuck it in the refrigerator for two weeks. That made all the difference in the world. The packets just say it's hard. Um, and one of them actually suggested this and it worked great for all the seeds I tried and I tried five different species. So I strongly encourage you to do that. And then the other thing I do is I take, do you guys eat out ever? You get these plastic containers and you wonder what to do if anything with them other than put leftovers in them. Well, they're great little um, habitats or terrariums for actually sprouting the seeds and see if you can see this. Can you see the, those are common milkweed that have been sprouted and are ready for me to plant. So that took about three weeks or so for that to happen. And this is ultimately what you get. So those are some of the steps. And you can see down here on step five that um, that's what happens. The other thing you have to be careful of is that the roots often get tangled in the paper towels. You can't pull them out. You need to cut them out with very carefully because you don't want to damage the root. So the other thing to know about um, these milkweed plants that you can start on your own is that year one, it, it spends its whole life um, setting its roots and it stays pretty small. You won't have flowers generally in your first year. Year two, um, it will certainly host monarchs, which means of course monarchs will have lunch on it, but uh, it probably won't bloom. It may, but it probably won't. It's not until year three that you'll have the magnificent blooms on your milkweed. And the various types of milkweed grow to different heights, but I'll tell you the common milkweed that I grow, that I've, that's volunteered initially in my yard, uh, grows, I want to say, roughly six to seven feet tall. So it's pretty tall. And however, like the butterfly weed, for example, doesn't grow nearly as tall. So if you don't want anything that tall, then, you know, you'll want to choose uh, your milkweed accordingly. These are the three types that I have to give away for our raffle. We have the common milkweed, uh, which really has a beautiful flower. This is the showy and it's got more star-like flower to it. They're pointy. And then the orange butterfly weed. All right. Resources. So hopefully this has just piqued your interest in butterflies and monarchs and uh, supporting pollinators in our gardens. And here are some resources that um, that are available to you. Uh, right now, the Lake County Forest Preserve is doing a, a native plant sale and it's all online. So you don't even have to go anywhere. They're calling it, um, oh God, plant in your sweats or something like that. But it's very cute, but you can go to their site and you can actually buy native perennials, trees and bushes. It's a fundraiser and they'll be shipped to your house which is pretty cool because that's not usually how it's done, but given our year of COVID, that's how they're doing it this year. Um, this was, I thought, just an interesting butterfly field guard, guide. Um, so if you see butterflies out there that you want to identify, uh, it's a resource. Mind you, when you get this in my PowerPoint, these will not be live links. You're gonna have to copy and paste them. Um, and then there's, of course, the extension services, which is a great resource for many things, gardening. So if you have garden problems or what have you, they're a great resource. They're out of the University of Illinois in Champaign. Excuse me. All right, and finally, Lori put together some books here that are um, butterfly related. And my sister actually, um gave me one let's see if i can quickly find it i meant to put it on and it is called bringing nature home how you can sustain wildlife with native plants and it goes a lot into uh host plants for different types of butterflies and again remember sir butterflies will only lay eggs on the plants their larva will eat so if there's a particular type of butterfly you want to attract you want to make sure and have it what it is that they'll enjoy eating. 
Okay, another workshop coming up in the fall. Right now I'm saying 7 p.m. being optimistic that will be uh, more open at that time and not as available during the day, we'll see. Um, but gorgeous garlic grown at home. There are many different types of garlic. It's super fun and interesting to grow at home. Um, unlike all the plants we've been talking about, well, maybe milkweed sort of, is that you plant in the fall and you harvest in July the following year. It's a bulb, like a flower bulb. Um, although you just plant one little clove and uh, and anyway that'll be a fun workshop there's certain things you need to do to prevent mold and disease so i'll talk about all of that and then finally we'll be doing some sort of an autumn social or garden walk in september um, if we need to keep distance i thought a garden walk might be nice it's amazing how many beautiful gardens there are in our area and people like me who just do it for fun so that's a possibility. I'll probably send out a survey to see what people are interested in. We have about 200 people in the area who've participated in these gardening workshops. And then here I'm just encouraging you to stay in touch through Instagram, Facebook, and I also have my website. And that's where you also, many of you learned about this workshop or were sent to to register for this workshop. And there you can see uh, what workshops are coming up, and I'll also probably post the social.